If you turn back to Luke 4, well, this week is Vacation Bible School, and I pray for the Lord's blessing on that. I'm looking forward to my class, the high school class. I know the other teachers are, and I uh, pray that the Lord will use this to reveal himself. Marvin Stoniker is going to be preaching for us tonight. He's preaching in Danville this morning, and he's going to be come by and spend the night uh, with me tonight. Looking forward to that, and uh, he'll be here tonight. And also this week, there will be no midweek services as far as Wednesday night while we're having vacation Bible school. I have entitled the message for this morning, The First sermon of Christ. Chronologically, this took place before the Sermon on the Mount, and this is the first recorded sermon we have of the Lord Jesus Christ here in Luke chapter 4. Now, somebody may be thinking, what do you mean by sermon? What is a sermon? A sermon is a message from God's inspired word, giving the meaning of that passage through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a lot of things that go under the name of sermon that are not sermons. You know that as well as I do. But a sermon is a message from the scriptures with a man giving the meaning of that passage under the power of God the Holy Spirit. Now, in this passage of Scripture, the Lord read a Scripture from Isaiah chapter 61. And then he gave the meaning of the Scripture. He said, this day, this Scripture, is fulfilled in your ears. That's his comment with regard to the meaning of this passage of Scripture and the response. Verse 28, And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, anger, fury, They were so mad at this message they heard that they took the Lord Jesus and took him up to the brow of the hill where the city was built and they were going to throw him down head first down a cliff and kill him. That's how angry they were with this message. That was their response. Now, The Lord enters the temple after he had been in other places. He grew up in Nazareth. He was a hometown boy. And the people heard of his fame, the things that he was doing, the miracles he was performing. So he comes back to his hometown, and they're excited. They're excited. Hometown boy made good. You know, this is a crude illustration. Uh, Y'all know I'm a sports fan. Well, there's a young man that grew up here in Lexington, Kentucky, Walker Bueller, and he's the star pitcher of the Los Angeles Dodgers. And I'm always very interested in what he does because he's from Lexington. Well, that is a crude illustration, but that gives some idea. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. I thought of it. Uh, Maybe it's a dumb illustration, but uh, at any rate, The Lord comes back to his hometown and everybody has heard of all the glorious things he had been doing in Capernaum and in other places. And they were excited to hear what he had to say. Now, he, they listen to the Lord read this scripture and they knew exactly what he meant. That's why you could hear a pin drop. That's why every eye was fastened on him as he read this passage of scripture. 
One time, Brother Mahan, during the early years in Ashland, was preaching, and he simply read a passage of Scripture from Romans 9. No comment. He just read it. For the children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, as it's written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And as he stopped reading that passage of Scripture, somebody said vocally, It doesn't mean that. Well, that's pretty much the same response. When our Lord read this passage of Scripture, look, in verse 18, like I said, this is a passage from Isaiah 61. And people knew that this is a prophecy with regard to the Messiah. And I would love to have heard the way the Lord read the Scripture. But he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And I guarantee you, everybody in there knew exactly what he was saying. This is Jesus of Nazareth. We know his mom. We know his dad. We know his brothers and sisters. He grew up here. He's saying, he's the one. That's exactly what he is saying. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. Picture that in your mind. He closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. You see, they knew exactly what he meant. And he began to say unto them, this day, right now, present tense, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. I imagine you could have heard a pin drop as he sat there. Every eye fastened on him. Now the first thing that I would like us to consider is who it was he said he was sent for. It's so important. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has sent me to who? Well, there's a six-fold description of the people he was sent for. See how you fit in into this. He sent me to preach the gospel to the poor. Who are the poor? They don't have anything. They do not have anything that they can bring to the table that would make God accept or receive them. They are those without. Where do you fit in there? And then the next thing he mentions is he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Shattered. The heart is no good. The heart is beyond repair. Evil. An evil heart. A wicked heart. Broken. Beyond repair. Where do you fit in there? The third description. 
He hath sent me to preach deliverance to the captives. People who are in prison and cannot get out. People who are enslaved. They're captives to their evil nature. If you tell them a free will, they think that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. I'm enslaved to this evil, wicked nature. I cannot not sin. That's the place I'm at. Well, he is sent to preach deliverance to people who are captives. And then he came for the recovering of sight to them that are blind. People who cannot see any reason in themselves as to why God would have favor toward them. They can't see. They're they're not victims where it's not their fault and they ought to do something for me. No, they're not victims at all. They're people who their sin is all their fault and they can't see one reason as to why God in themselves, one reason as to why God would give them favor. And then he says to set at liberty, set free them that are bruised or crushed. Crushed is the word. To preach, verse 19, the acceptable year of the Lord. And that's a reference to the year of Jubilee. Now, the year of Jubilee, you can read about it in Leviticus chapter 25. It's one of the most amazing things in the Bible. It teaches us the gospel. Every 50 years, the silver trumpet of Jubilee would sound. And whatever debt you had if you were a slave that couldn't pay your way out of your condition and you're enslaved all your debts are canceled now do you owe any money right now i dare say some of you do maybe just a few of you but uh, do you owe any money can you imagine what it would mean if all of a sudden all your they're paid you don't owe a dime And if you were a slave, you couldn't get out from under that bondage. But on the year of Jubilee, if you were a slave, you were set free. You were no longer a slave. Anything you lost through your inability to pay was restored back to you. And you were given a year's vacation. The land was given a year's rest. Now, who that means something to? I tell you what, if somebody owed you money, if that was your slave working for you, that wouldn't be good news when you heard that silver trumpet, would it? You'd think you're the loser by it. But who was it that was excited about this? People who were slaves, people who were in debt, and people who could not pay their debts. They'd lost everything. Now the Lord says, I am the year of Jubilee. You know, I think this is so interesting. There's not one time in all of the word of God where it's ever said that the children of Israel ever actually practiced the year of Jubilee. They were commanded to, but they didn't. I guarantee you the quote powers that be made sure it didn't happen. I mean, a lot of people lose a lot of money in this. But the Lord said, I am the fulfillment. This day, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And all, verse 22, and all bear him witness. And wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Now what the Lord is saying is, I am the one anointed by the Spirit of God to preach the gospel to the poor. I am the one. I am the one who heals the brokenhearted. I am the one 
who delivers the captives. I am the one who gives sight to the blind. I am the one. <laughs> That's what he's saying. I am the one. I am the only one. I'm the Messiah. I am the deliverer. I am the one who saves. Now that is exactly what the Lord was saying to these people. And they heard. They heard. And their response was, is not this Joseph's son? We've seen him grow up. We know his relatives. We saw him working in the carpenter shop. Is not this Joseph's son? All they could see was the son of Joseph. They could not see the son of God. That's the difference. They could see the son of Joseph. Hey, he'd been around for 30 years. Our kids went to school with him. But they could not see him as God the Son. Now let me say this. Please listen to this real carefully. Salvation, God's salvation, is seeing who he is. Did you hear that? God's salvation is seeing who he is. Everything else comes out of that. Everything. You see who he is, you'll see who you are. You see who he is, you'll see your need of him. You see who he is, you'll see that he is salvation. Salvation is seeing who he is. And when you see who he is, you see him not only as Joseph's son, but the son of God. Now, what does that mean? Somebody says, well, I believe that you probably would ask a lot of people um, in Lexington or anywhere else, do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? They'd say, probably, yeah, not knowing what it meant. Uh, they'd been raised to hear that. Or maybe they think he's the Son of God the same way Adam was. Adam was called the Son of God. Here's what the Son of God means. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus Christ is all that the living God is. He possesses every attribute of deity. He is all powerful. He is absolutely sovereign. He is absolutely just. He is omniscient. He, every attribute of God. He's independent. I love his independence. That means he doesn't need me and you. You and me need him. But he doesn't need us. He is God the Son. They saw him as Joseph's son, but they did not see him as the Son of God. And so here is what he said to them in verse 23 after they said, well, this is Joseph's son. And he said unto them, you will surely say unto me this proverb. And this was a well-known proverb. Physician, heal thyself. Now, you claim to be a physician, heal yourself. And I'm sure that this was said many times over the years to a, maybe a doctor gets sick. And they said, well, heal yourself if you're a real physician. You know, it was, it was really a, a proverb of derision. Physician, heal yourself. A proverb of derision. It, they, it came from a low view of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he says, you'll surely say unto me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. Now you've come home, we've heard about what you did in Capernaum. Do it here and prove yourself. Do it here and prove yourself. This comes from a low view of his person. And there's somewhat of a sense of entitlement here. What you did there, do here. 
this is your hometown. We're, we get, you, you need to do this for us. What, what we've heard there, do here as well. Just a high view of themselves and a low view of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, verse 24, Verily I say unto you. Now, this is the Lord speaking. This is divine authority. I love it in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, You've heard it said by them of old, I say unto you. That's his authority as the God man. Verily, I say unto you. And then he makes this statement, and he actually made this, three, this statement three times during his earthly ministry. Verily, I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. And they rejected him, didn't they? I mean, he's a hometown boy. It's, it's this familiarity, a, a wrong, you've heard the uh, statement, familiarity breeds contempt. Well, here it did with him. They said, and he used this statement, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But, verse 25, I tell you of a truth. He gives his response to their unbelief by a declaration of the sovereignty of God in salvation. Now, he could have said, God is sovereign in salvation. They probably would have all said amen. <laughs> but he illustrates what he is saying with two illustrations taken from the Old Testament in this declaration of the absolute sovereignty of God in salvation. Now, what he's saying is you don't believe me. You don't believe me. You don't believe I'm he. You don't believe that I am the one anointed by God. You don't believe I am the one who gives deliverance to the captives. You don't believe that I am the year of Jubilee. You don't believe me. I couldn't help but think of John chapter 6 where he said to those people, you see me and believe not. All the Father giveth me shall come to me. You don't come to me you're not one that was given to me of my father is what he's saying to them. No, no room for different interpretations. There it is. All that the father giveth me shall come to me. Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Well, the same thing is going on here. Same thing. Look at this illustration. Verse 25. I tell you the truth. Many widows were in Israel. In the day of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months. Now, I want you to think about that. Three years and six months without a drop of rain. You think of the suffering that created in the land of Israel. What if in Central Kentucky, what if in the United States, God withheld the rain for three years and six months? Great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them, not one widow in Israel, but unto none of them was Elijah sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. Now the Lord passed by. He did not send his prophet to one widow in Israel. But he sent his prophet to a Gentile woman and supplied her with food and water. And then, in case you didn't hear, the Lord gives another example. Verse 27. Many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. How many? Who knows? Thousands? Hundreds of thousands? I don't know. Many, though, is what the Lord said. Many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, 
and none of them was cleansed. Not a one. Save in name in the Syrian. He wasn't an Israelite. He was a general in the Syrian army that had been used by God to defeat the Israelites. And many people had been captured through his rule. He's the only one that God in his sovereignty sent his prophet to, to save. Now, there isn't any other way to take this. The Lord is making a declaration of his utter sovereignty in salvation. You don't believe me. God, as an act of his sovereignty, has passed you by. If you continue in this, it'll only be because God passed you by as an act of his justice, as an act of his irreprehensible justice. He passed you by. You don't believe me? You have a low opinion of me? You don't see me as the Messiah? God has passed you by. Now somebody says, that's hard. The only thing that would make you think that's hard is because you have a high view of yourself. If you believe you're a sinner, if God passed you by, would he be right? Come on now. Would he be right if he passed you by? Now, these people evidently did not think <laughs> that would be right. They got very angry. Look in verse 28. And all they, everybody that heard this, all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Now let me say this before I go on with these people's response. The gospel is free. If you are poor, if you are brokenhearted, if you're a captive to sin, if you're blind and can't see why God would save you, if you are shattered, if you're a slave, Listen to me. Jesus Christ came to save you. If you're a sinner. If you're a sinner. I guarantee you Jesus Christ came to save you. Because scripture says he came to save sinners. The gospel is free. And if you're a sinner he came to save you. And bless God you're saved if he came to save you. This declaration of the sovereignty of God does not keep people from being saved who otherwise would have been. It doesn't do that. If you take it that way, you're taking it the wrong way. God's sovereign grace saves people who would most certainly have been damned. But he saves. So when we're preaching the absolute sovereignty of God, the door of mercy is open wide to every sinner and the only thing that will keep you from Christ is your personal righteousness. It's not God's sovereignty that prevents you from coming to Christ. It's your personal self-righteousness that keeps you from looking to Christ alone. The door of mercy is open wide to any sinner he that cometh to me, the Lord said, I will in no wise, for no reason, cast out. So don't, don't look at this declaration of God's sovereignty in salvation as closing the door. It closes the door to self-righteous, but it opens up the door for anybody who needs Christ. Anybody who needs mercy. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is his promise. God's absolute sovereignty does not prevent men from being saved. But let me ask you, are you one of those people 
with a low view of Jesus Christ. You don't really believe that every attribute of God dwells in his body. Do you believe that you're not poor, you have a sense of entitlement, you're not beyond repair, you're certainly not captive, you have a free will. You see why God would save you. After all, you're as good as anybody else, better than a lot. Uh, you are not a slave that's lost everything, and you don't, you're not somebody without a penny's worth of merit to pay. Now, if that would describe you, you're someone who's passed by if you die that way. You're someone he's passed by if you die that way. And it's all your fault. It's all your fault. He's altogether glorious to not have this high view of him. If you die that way, you're somebody that he has passed by. Verse 28, and all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. They were angry over what Jesus Christ said. How could this be fair? How could this be right? I mean, after all, look at us. And he talks about us like that. And he makes us nothing but pawns in God's hand. We don't like this. They rose up. They thrust him out of the city and led him under the brow of the hill whereon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. We're getting rid of this man. We're not going to listen to this any more. But I don't know how this happened. I mean, they, he's, they've got him up in their arms getting ready to throw him off the cliff. And somehow, you see, his time is not yet. The time was coming when he was going to let men do what they wanted. That's the cross. But not yet. Not yet. So he passed through their midst and they weren't able to perform their wicked design on him for this reason he didn't let him he didn't let him now we have the scripture says all they in the synagogue everybody in there he didn't have one person at this time maybe his disciple really this was before the calling of the twelve all they you read about the calling after this all they, everybody who listened to him at this time, thumbs down on him. They did not believe. Why? They had a low view. They didn't believe Jesus Christ is who he said he is. Now I want to close by looking at something that's just the opposite. The thief on the cross. Um... Right now, at any rate, other than the Lord Jesus Christ, he's my favorite character in Scripture. Thief on the cross. He's nailed to a cross. And he sees that one beside him hanging on a cross. Now, previously he'd been cursing him, making fun of him, but something happened to that man. It's called grace. It's called revelation. Something happened to that man. As he saw his buddy cursing Christ, he said, don't you fear God? That's God hanging beside us. Don't you fear God? Seeing you're in the same condemnation. And we indeed justly. We're receiving the due reward of our deeds. He didn't have any sense of entitlement that he had some kind of rights. We're receiving exactly what we have coming. But this man, this God-man, hath done nothing amiss. He believed in the absolute sinlessness of Jesus Christ. Do you believe he's God? Do you believe he's sinless? Let's go on. He looked at that one hanging on that tree that seemingly was so helpless, nailed to a cross, and he said, Lord, you're the Lord. 
You're in control of everything that's taking place. You're the Lord. And you're going to come back as a mighty reigning king. I know you're going to die, but you're not going to stay dead. You're going to come back as a mighty reigning king in your kingdom. As king of kings and lord of lords. Remember me. Remember me when you come in your kingdom. You're the Lord. And if you simply remember me, if you own my worthless name before your father, nothing else will need to be said. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the Lord said to him, unlike these people who tried to kill him, um, he said to him, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that we might be among those that thy son has come to save. That we might see that we are poor, broken hearted, captive, blind, shattered, slaves in debt with no ability to pay. Lord, you came to save such. Deliver us from being among those who have a low view of thy son and seem nothing more as the son of Joseph. Lord, we say with the Ethiopian eunuchs, Lord, we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Lord, we ask in Christ's name that you would create faith in each heart here according to your will. Enable us to believe thy gospel. In Christ's name we pray.